Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman of the Football History Dude Podcast, and I'm stopping by this show real quick to tell you about a couple of cool giveaways that we have going on here at the network. Both are autographed books covering various topics of the NFL. The first is The Point After, How One Resilient Kicker Learned There Is More to Life Than the NFL by ex-NFL kicker Sean Conley. It goes over his unique experience as a walk-on kicker at the University of Pitt after never playing high school football. And then it gets into some of his time playing for NFL teams and so much more beyond the gridiron. The other is from author Kevin Bryant. His book is titled Spies on the Sidelines, the High Stakes World of NFL Espionage. This book started as a curiosity, kind of a passion project to understand everything revolving around well, Spygate. But this put Kevin down a rabbit hole learning about all sorts of espionage that has occurred throughout the history of the NFL. Both permissible <laughs> and often the illicit techniques of gathering intel to try to impact the outcome of the game. To sign up for your chance to win an autographed copy of one of these books, all you gotta do is head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways and sign up. That's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. Again, check out all the other podcasts that we have in the Sports History Network as well. But now, back to your regularly scheduled journey to the Sports History Timeline. One of the first things you see when you look at a football player is his helmet, the old headgear, the hard shell. But well, we have a gentleman that's joining us today, Blaze Da Silva, who has HelmetHistory.com that honors the tradition and history of each team with their helmets. His story's coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And we have an interesting show tonight. We have a guest that has a helmet site that has like almost every helmet you can imagine of every team you can imagine and i'm not just talking the nfl and i'm not just talking uh, you know the cfl he has those leagues and he goes all the way back but he's got almost every i think every college football team as well and he goes into some of the the more exotic leagues the wfl xfl and some others uh, his name is blaze da silva he his website is helmethistory.com and blaze da silva welcome to the pig pen Darren, thank you for having me uh, as a guest and being able to share with you a little bit of my passion around football history and in particular, you know, football helmets. As you were just alluding to on my website, helmethistory.com, I have documented through photographs um, the helmet history of, like you said, not only the NFL, the CFL, all 130, actually I think it's 131 this year with uh, one of those FCF schools moving up, but all, all uh, FBS teams. I think I've got about 65 to 70 uh, FCS teams. Um, I've got leagues that have uh, expired, obviously, WFL, uh, the old XFL, the, the new XFL, USFLs, um, NFL Europe, w, World League of American Football. Um, so there, there, there's plenty out there for anybody who's a, a, a history buff of, of any of the uh, uh, football leagues. Uh, I'm working on the Arena Football League. I've I started it last summer and stopped. I had to take a break, but uh, I've probably got about 60 to 70 percent of the photos that I need for the Arena Football League. So that's probably the next one on. But yeah, for anybody who's a, a history buff uh, of, of any of these football leagues and loves helmets, and I think everybody loves helmets. I mean, when you when you talk about football and you talk about helmets, people's eyes light up. They talk about their favorite helmets. They remember big games that they were at and what the teams were wearing, things like that. So helmets, you know, they're a great they're a great conversation piece with anybody who's a football fan. It, you know, they are probably the most recognizable 
symbol of football besides the ball itself, the shape of the ball itself. You put a, a silhouette of a football helmet, you know, most people well, around the, the Western world will know exactly what you're talking about, even if football is not prevalent in their country. It's just that recognizable thing. It's a very interesting uh, piece of equipment in many ways. And the, the, just the color and pageantry and designs and safety features and everything that's evolved over the years. It's really interesting. And I'm, I'm glad you have a site like this. I'm glad I, I found this recently because it's, it's really interesting. And so what I need to know, you know what, why don't you go back Somewhere in the beginning, where did you start to get first a passion for football? And then yeah. how did that evolve into helmets? Yeah, so I, I grew up in Seattle. And as a kid growing up, I will admit I was a Washington Husky fan, even though I ended up going to Washington State. But I was a Washington uh, Husky fan growing up and started going to their games. Actually, my first game was in 1977. I think I was about 11 years old. Um, and it was... Um, Warren Moon's senior season at the University of Washington, and they didn't get off to such a great start. It was a one and four start, and they ended up winning out and going to the Rose Bowl and beating a, a top five ranked Michigan team. Um, and so that was kind of some of my first memories. And then also at the same time, the Seattle Seahawks were an expansion franchise in 76. So my, my interest in football kind of dovetailed with the Seahawks coming into Seattle, as well as my interest in, 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 in the University of, of Washington. And back then, you know, in the 70s, one of the things that I used to collect uh, was the gumball helmets that uh, you could buy, you know, in the grocery store and the gumball machines, they were 25 cents. So we used to collect a lot of those gumball helmets over the years, as well as other types of memorabilia that helmets on it. Um, there was a, um, this was actually in, in the early 70s, I can't even remember, I think it was probably six or seven, but there was a, uh, back then Gatorade was sold in only a 32 ounce glass bottle. Um, and they had a top, a metal top to it, and they did this promotion with the NFL where they had the helmets on, you know, on the uh, top of the uh, uh, of the lid. And so we used to collect those um, uh, lids as well. In fact, obviously, all that stuff lost it over the years. Um, but with the uh, advent of eBay, I was actually able to go on and purchase, you know, a set of those Gatorade lids as well as a bunch of gumball helmets. So. Um, my fascination, fast forward, my fascination with helmets was kind of resurrected with eBay because all of a sudden you discover eBay and this was probably 99, 2000 and I could go on there and buy a lot of these things that were from my childhood. So whether it was buying gumball helmets and buying, you know, rare sets and other things um, to, like I said, the Gatorade lids to other helmet type paraphernalia memorabilia. It was just that kind of got me back into it. And then what really kind of then started to catapult it was the gumball. They'd stopped making the gumball helmets, I think, in sometime in the early 90s. And Riddell kind of took over with this helmet called a Pocket Pro, which was about a two inch helmet, a little bit bigger than what the gumball helmet was, but much, much more realistic um, because it wasn't the stickers and the little funny white face mask. I mean, they looked, they looked great. And so they made current NFL teams. They made current college teams. And made, I think they made a CFL set. But there were these guys on eBay who would take these helmets, strip them of their paint, repaint them, and put logos on them, vinyl logos on them. And they'd make pretty much any version of any team that you wanted. And I actually started with this gentleman. I bought... I bought about 80 arena football helmets from him. And this was probably, I can't remember the exact year. I want to say it's probably 2003 or 2004. But I bought about 80 arena football helmets from him. And he said, hey, what else do you want? And I said to him, I want everything. And I kid you not, I mean, when I said everything, it was everything. And so I have been working with him since 2003, um, making everything. And, you know, today um, I have over 7,000 Pocket Pro helmets Oh. which is um, uh, been a, an amazing journey. I actually added a second guy in about 2016 or 17 because my first guy was talking about stop stop doing it. And I said, you can't stop on me. I, I'm, I'm so deep into this. What, you know, what am I going to do with all this? And so he, I was transitioning to this second guy and then the first guy ended up not giving it up. And so I've actually needed both of them because one, going back and fixing some things that either needed fixed or, 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 or we were missing. And that was part of the research, which led to my website, which we'll get to in a second. 
So there was a lot of work to do, even though I thought we were more closer to being done. And then the new guy was kind of handling all these college helmets that are new every year because there's 250 to 280 new helmets a year in college. So he's been working on that. So we're almost, we're almost done. Um, you know, NFL is pretty much done. That's been pretty, you know. Let, uh, let me pause just a second so that the listeners, I mean, if you're by a computer, go to helmethistory.com, the Blazes site, and up at the top, he's got an about button. Click on that about button. And there is a, a picture of Mr. Da Silva standing there, and which I assume is only probably part of your collection. But it's, yeah. there's probably a couple thousand of, of these helmets yeah. right there. And it's, yeah. it's a pretty impressive picture. So yeah, I'm sorry. So, no, please continue. No, no. So, so um, we're almost caught up. We're still, we're, we're, we're probably, if I, if I look at the list, we're probably about 200 helmets, mostly college from 2021 um, from catching up. So we've been, we've been working real hard in, in, in getting there, but um, building out all these helmets over the years, I would tell you up until about 2016 or so, I didn't do any of the research. The guy who made the helmets, he was doing the research and he was cranking them out and that was great. And then I realized that like, we just weren't catching up. You know, we were making, you know, I don't know, three to 400 helmets a year, but I felt like we were just never getting ahead of the game. And so I started to get into the research business of, okay, I'm gonna start researching college every year. So I, I, I've changed my process a lot over the years, but. Um, I started researching starting in 2017, like, okay, I'll start helping you with the research side so you don't have to spend all your time on research, you can just spend your time on making the helmets. And so basically my process on research is every week I look at every game and determine if it's a new helmet or not. I have a spreadsheet, I keep track of every team, every by conference. I do CFL, I do NFL is pretty much, they announced it at the beginning of the year, there might be a tiny, tiny change. Um, there's not too many in the NFL, but essentially I am researching it, making all these changes. And so as I was doing that in 17 and 18 and 19, I kind of started to realize I've got all these photos because I would capture photos. It wasn't just looking at it and just writing it down. I would capture it. I said, I've got all these photos. I should build a website. And I thought I had more photos than I did. I probably ultimately had less than 10% of the photos that I needed to build out the website as you see it today because either I didn't have a clear enough picture or close enough picture. I needed both the, the logo and the stripe or the back, depending on the helmet and what the design is. And so it, I just started, it was in the summer of 2020, kind of a COVID project, I'd call it. And I just said, I'm going to build out a website that's going to detail the helmet history of every school, every NFL team, and then just so on and so on and so on and just building it out. But the focus initially was college. That's where I started. I started with, you know, FBS colleges. And the reason why I also started it was that summer, I was doing a, a Twitter post a day. Actually, back up. In 2019, the 150th anniversary of college football, I decided to do a post a day kind of through the season leading into the national championship game where I posted a photo of my helmet collection, one school a day. So I did, I did it by conference um, and I alphabetically by conference and I did it over 130 odd days. I posted one school a day. So that was kind of fun. It was an, a neat project. I kind of got people aware of what I was doing. And then I, then the next year with COVID, I decided I would post a helmet fact a day about each school. So something interesting about a helmet, something unique about a helmet. If they've only done a helmet like this one time. I don't know. That you, if you go back and look at my Twitter feed, you'll see. But I did a fact a day using a photo. And it was as I was going through that project where I started to go, you know, I should probably build out the website. Between all this work I'm doing during the season and now doing this post today and I'm getting more and more photos. So I decided, all right, I'm going to tackle this. And I think Rutgers was the first school I did because... I would think I was in the R's when I was posting my fact a day, but literally I just started with that. And um, I'm not a I'm not a webmaster, web designer. I had my sister in law who's very helpful and very graphically oriented. I said I need a template, so she kind of created the template of my site, and away I went. And you know it was a learning process along the way. Depending on how complicated a school was, I could do one to two schools a day. Um, it depended on how many helmets they had. It, it depended on 
how easily accessible were resources to find out what helmet they wore. Um, and a lot of that is using yearbooks from the school. Um, certainly, if, the, if a school was great with yearbooks, it could be into the 2000s. A lot of schools have stopped printing yearbooks because of the cost of it, but you know, some schools stopped in the 80s, um, but at least that would get me from the 80s, maybe back to the 1930s. Um, actually, the hardest era, if they didn't have the yearbooks, was probably the 90s and 2000s, um, because uh, despite the internet being as great as it is, I feel like, I feel like there's a gap there. Um, and I would struggle, especially with helmets that weren't worn, maybe it was a one game special, which was pretty rare, right, back in the 90s or, or too early 2000s. Um, those were like some of my harder era. Like the internet's really good, 2010 to current. And the yearbooks were really good if they went up to the 80s going backwards. It was that kind of middle period. But if a school didn't have yearbooks, then that created even more challenges. Um, so it was, it was like a treasure hunt um, in finding photos. And like I said, yearbooks were always great, um, but it was, it was a treasure hunt. Um, and I'm probably not as resourceful as I could be. I mean, I, uh, one of the guys who makes my helmets, I mean, he's great at digging up school newspapers, the student newspaper, and he was really good at accessing that um, and finding some things. Um, but it was just, it was, like, it was like a treasure hunt. And I literally, it took me probably six months or so to build out college. And then from there, you know, NFL was relatively easy other than say the 20s, 30s, 40s would be a little more challenging. And that's when I leaned on the folks at, uh, you know, gridironuniforms.com. They, they were fantastic in helping me out with some of those older NFL photos and just kept building it out. Like I said, CFL, USFL, WFL, XFL, AAF, um, UFL. I mean, there's enough, there's enough on there. Um, and then I slowly have been adding FCS schools. Um, again, if they have yearbooks, I'm very successful. Um, but I've been trying to add, I don't think I'll probably get to all 100 and whatever there are, 125, 130 schools. Um, I've, I've probably reached my limit on, on, on doing those, but arena football definitely is, 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 is one that I want to do, but you know, it's, it's, it, it never ends because even the other day when I'm on Twitter and I see, I follow a bunch of, you know, sites and guys are posting photos of, of game, old games and stuff. And I see a helmet, I don't know if I have as, I don't know if I have that photo as, as, as good as that photo is, or maybe I don't have it in color, right? So I'll bookmark it. And so the other day I spent about two hours going through all my bookmarks on Twitter and looking at my photo and going, oh, I need to replace that. That's, you know, and that's a better photo and that's a better angle. So I'm constantly trying to, you know, upgrade it. I know that there's some photos, certainly anything from like 1990 on, there's some photos where I feel like I got to do some more digging to get a better in focus um, uh, picture. So I'll, that's, that's, on the list of things to do. Um, but I'll give you an example. The other day, I, I caught this one because um, the NFL isn't that interesting, right? They don't really change their helmets that much. So on some teams, I haven't done this with every team, but on some teams, I'm really interested. Well, I've done this on all teams where I do the back of the helmet if they have a number. And it's interesting to see how numbers have changed over the years, whether it's the font, the location. So I've got all that. But there was an interesting thing the Raiders did last year. So when Al Davis passed away in 2013 they put an owl logo on the back of their helmet and first they had a bigger shield then they went to a smaller shield then they moved it to the other side of the helmet so that's all happening over the course of a year and then that was fine that stayed constant until last year when 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 john madden passed away so they put a shield for jm on the back of their helmet and they put it on the so al's on the right side next to the stripe and they put john madden on the left side for the first game they put him to the left of the flag. So he's way away from the stripe. So I had that on my site and I had bookmarked another photo of just absentmindedly and I was looking through the other day. So that was week, that was game 16. Well, game 17, the last game of the regular season and then their, their playoff game against the Bengals. They actually moved the JM next to the stripe just like Al is on the other side of the stripe. So they're much, they look uniform, they're, you know, uh, uh, you know symmetrical. I didn't, I didn't caught that until I was going through this shit the other day and I realized, you know, oh crap, I got to add that little photo to my site. And then I had to figure out, did they do it in the playoff game or did they actually do it in game 17? So there's always little things to be adding and trying to make it better and more accurate. And, 
you know, what, someday I'll, I'll look at the design and try to decide, should I design it differently? Is it the best way to view it? It's actually better viewed on a desktop than mobile. It's more challenging on a mobile device just because of the way it's been set up. So is that something I need to change long term? But there's always something going on and it's great. It, and, and, and I'm just getting myself right now geared up for the college season. Right now I'm tracking CFL, but I actually didn't, I couldn't even be bothered to put a spreadsheet together for the CFL. I just look every week and I just put it in there, which is fine. But for college, I've got to get all my spreadsheets lined up. So I, I have to type in which weeks they play, you know, because they have bye weeks and this, that. So I know what I'm looking for. And I've got to, so I, I've, I've got a few hours of work. But during the season, during the season, college between, um, uh, between updating the website, between tweeting them out, because I like to tweet them out too, although I'm not trying to be always the first person out, but I do my best. Um, tweeting, and I don't generally try to tweet before the game because I want to make sure they actually wore it. So there's every once in a while I do, do them before the game, but I generally try to do them on the Saturday. But I, I, I've got to update my website, I've got to tweet them out, and I've got to update my spreadsheet. I mean, I've got, you know, 15 hours of work a week on this wow. project, you know. Well, it's, it's, well while we're on the top yeah. subject, why don't you, if you want to give out your social media, your Twitter handle so, so people can, can follow you. Oh, yeah. Uh, Twitter handle is uh, at WTF Coach. Um, story behind that is, I think about 10, 12 years ago, I had a website, um, WTFCoach.com. It doesn't exist and somebody's squatted it, so I don't have it. But I literally did a blog on bad coaching decisions. And I don't have all the database statistical analyses, like with the percentages of, you know, to go for it or not. But just from a common sense standpoint, I used to blog about every NFL game because there's horrible coaching decisions, you know, primarily end of half, end of game type stuff. And then I would pick certain college games that were close and had issues. So I, I did a, again, it was a passion project there. You know, I wasn't making any money or doing any advertising or anything like that. It was just, I got to do it. And it was a lot of work and it was a lot of fun. Um, but I only did that for one season. So that's where the handle started and I didn't never change it. So at WTF coach is my Twitter handle. And like I said, I do tweet out, you know, all the things about, um, new helmets pretty much in any league that I can get my, my hands on. Um, and then uh, my, like I said, my website, helmethistory.com is, is where you can see all this stuff. Okay. Yeah. We are here with uh, blaze da Silva helmethistory.com and a uh, great, great website, uh, blaze now, I noticed that, like, I'm a Notre Dame fan. That's that's my FBS school. So I, I of course, one of the first ones I went to is I went to the Independence, and which you have them laid out very nicely. You have your the front page you go to, uh, listeners, and there is you have like the the college football FBS, and you can see the NFL, and you see uh, the FCS schools and XFL, and there's a whole bunch there. It's very easy to navigate. Uh, once you get into, if you go into the, the FBS schools, you can see there by conference and the, the independents like Notre Dame have their own section too with Army and, and the, the UMass and UConn. And you go, you click on Notre Dame and then up pops the most current helmet, uh, I believe is the way you have it laid out. Yes. Yeah, yeah, 20, I, start with, I, start with I start with current. And I scroll all the way down. So I wonder how far back he goes. Well, he goes all the way back in the leather helmet era. He's back in the thirties uh, with Notre Dame. I know that, which like you said, had to be a challenge, but I'm sure those yearbooks helped you out. Yeah. Uh, the yearbooks, the yearbooks, if they have the yearbooks, then I can get to the thirties pretty easily. Um, although even, I mean, you can imagine what yearbooks were like back then. And sometimes they don't have in-game photos, you know, it's just a, you know, it's just the headshots and things like that. So that, you know, I tried my best to do as far back as I could, um, you know, uh, uh, Notre Dame again, hasn't had too many helmets, although the Shamrock series in the, in the 2010s has you know, given them another eight to 10 interesting helmets. Um, interesting one about Notre Dame, I have this photo but I just, it's not, I, I, I don't know when it was worn and I don't have, it's not close enough, but it's a Joe Montana, so, you know, late 70s. And there's some sticker that he put on his helmet. And I think it's only Joe. I don't think it was a, whole, a team thing. And I emailed somebody I know who works at the Notre Dame Athletic Office. I said, could you ask the sports information guys, do they have anything about this and they, they had they had they had zero for me um so that's one that's like sitting out there like oh man i wish i could figure out what exactly it's a big white kind of sticker on the side over here and hmm. and that was one i'm like trying to figure that out there's some i'll give you an example um uh miami in the late 60s used to put some logos slash sayings on their helmet um you know uh uh 
for sp- specific to it, the team they were playing. So they had one against LSU, I think one against Colorado, maybe Alabama, and the f- um, the big one that at least I have the visual of this one. I can't find good visuals of the other ones. Um, I've put them on my site, but they're hard to see. But the one is that against Florida, they have a like, get a gator, um, and that one you can you can you can really see. So those are some interesting ones. So there's some there's things that I'm trying to chase down, but it's it's pretty tough, you know, when you're 50 years out and and maybe the people who might know about it aren't aren't necessarily around anymore. But um, there's always the treasure hunt, trying to find out the last piece of information on something. Okay, so you mentioned one of the hardest things you've been, one of your uh, your red herrings you're chasing that that Montana Notre Dame helmet. What what's one of the ones that uh, maybe that you really had a challenge to find it and you found it and and what what's that feel like you know when you find that treasure on your treasure hunt? Yeah, I mean th- there were a number of them, um, and um, it usually revolves around one game special helmets. Those are the ones that are the hardest, and I'm not talking about in the in the in the last five years or anything like that. Although, sorry, I'll, I'll take that back. There are some FCS schools who did some one game helmets, and you can imagine finding pictures on FCS schools is a little bit harder. I will tell you, I did have uh, when I was doing some schools, and I can't remember which schools they were now, but because uh, I, I was doing FCS most in the last you know six to nine months, but when I was doing, there were definitely two or three FCS ones that I found that. I, I was like, wow, and I, I didn't think I didn't think they would be there. So there were a couple of those. The ones that um, there are I, across my site, across all the teams, I would tell you there's probably twenty photos that I'm missing. So there's some Fresno State one. Fresno State and New Mexico are probably the two schools that come up. That have the most missing photos. I don't I don't know what it is about those two. They're a little challenging. Fresno State had like eight different helmets in the 1970s, so that didn't help me either. But those those are two that I've probably got to re-engage with. It's probably a local newspaper thing that I'm going to have to figure out. Um, problem with local newspapers is they might not uh, have a good photo, and they won't. They'll be black and white most likely, so it doesn't help me as much. But those are two schools. I'm trying to think if I... Well, the good good thing is that most of the games were played Saturday, and usually it's, it was traditionally the Sunday papers where you yeah. had the most color. And so, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe that helps your job a little easier. <laughs> yeah, well, probably those are smaller towns, too. They're not the big the big newspapers, which which is challenging. Um, and the other thing is I don't feel like signing up for a million subscriptions to have to cancel later to just <laughs> get a right. photo. So I haven't, I haven't embarked on that. But there's... Those are two schools that come to mind instantly. Of like, oh, those are the two that are that are the the ones that I would really, really um, would like to get get more of. I'm trying to think if there's anything, if there was anything monumental. I'm like, oh my god, I couldn't, can't believe I found it. I guess there was there was a Colorado one game special in like 1997 or 98, and I was actually able to connect with the the sports information department and. He, he found a photo for me and sent that on. So um, that was pretty cool. Nice. So I have reached out to some schools. You know, I reach out to schools all the time, not only about historical stuff, but even current. Um, like, let's say I see a new helmet on Saturday. And I'm like, was that really new? Did they do something? And, I, and I'll ask them a specific question. And they'll respond back to me, um, especially the equipment managers. when I, And they're like, ah, oh, you picked up on that. That is actually new. We did... You know, and it could be as small as we well, did add that thin black outline to the stripe that you can barely see. But yes, it is there, right? And, and I'll call that a new helmet. So it doesn't have to be a big change to be considered a new helmet. In my, in, in what I've done, not only on the website but in making the helmets as well, any change is considered new. So whether it's face mask color, um, whether it's obviously helmet color, whether it's logo change, whether it's stripe change, but it can be an outline. And you would be surprised at how many times I. Really, that's a change. It can be a matte helmet to a glossy helmet. That's been the new thing in the last five years. Where you know it was, well, it was previously usually glossy, and then they've gone to matte. And I consider that a new helmet. And which is why, when I look at my website, and listen, there's a lot of great information out there on the web. And you know, there's a great a great website, helmetproject.com. He's done a phenomenal job too. But I do like to say that I think mine is the most accurate representation of what teams have worn because I have gone down to that excruciating detail 
um, of calling something new, whether, like I said, it goes from glossy to matte, whether it is an outline around a logo or what have you, like the, the tiniest change that may not be reflected on, on other websites. Also, I do go back to the 1930s, and also um, I can say with 100% certainty that especially over the last, let's call it seven or eight years of college, where it's been so many changes that my site is accurate to every game because I have literally gone through every game and looked at photos and made sure that what I had was right. And so I feel like I have the most accurate representation. Something you did say earlier when you said, hey, you go to Notre Dame and you'll see the most current helmet. This was interesting because when I first started the website, first Rutgers and the first, say, five schools, I had done it the opposite. I'd started with, you know, 1930s and then kind of was going this way. And it was one of the guys who makes my helmets. He goes, you know, I think you'd be better off starting with the most current because they're more interesting. Like the photos from the 30s aren't great. It's just leather helmets. It doesn't, you know, it's not as interesting. And so he gave me the suggestion you should flip it. And so I did flip it and start with the most current um, because it's, there's more going on. There's more, more interesting. I, I think that, that was, was good advice. I, he's spot on there. Cause that, that's, yes. that's a really interesting and it's yes. a logical find. It's probably, you know, if people want to go in and, and see what the latest, uh, you know, uh, a month from now when the season starts and they're saying, Hey, you know, Oregon's wearing a new helmet and I'm going to go to, you know, helmethistory.com. Hey, there it is. You know, that, yeah. That's, yeah. they can find it real readily. Now, something you said earlier, you said there's about 280 FBS new helmets every season. So, yes. My, my, I'm not a mathematician, but I'm calculating. That's probably about you know two per team on average, except for, uh, I'm sure there's teams like I just mentioned, Oregon, who probably changes uh, quite a bit more than that. It seems like every time I watch them, they have a new uniform on. So how do you – so you're going through – you're seeing, you know, uh, like 65 games every week of just college football. You're keeping an eye on and, and taking a look at those helmets in, in great detail. So, yes. So, so my process, my process, um, and again, it depends also where I am each week. I, if, if I'm at home, it's a lot easier. You know, I'm traveling. I'm going to a few games myself. Um, I'm at weddings, things like that. I mean, I'm constantly, you know, looking and searching and doing things because I too try to tweet out as much as I can in real time. Um, if I know I'm going to be busy over the weekend, I will tweet a bunch of stuff out Thursday and Friday just to get it off my list. Um, but essentially what I do, and the early season is terrible because you just mentioned 65 games, but in the early part of the season when everybody's playing, you know, FCS schools and stuff, you might be talking 100 to 110 games. Oh, that's true. Plus, I am actually now tracking 65 FCS schools, so add that to the list. Um, and not all of those have f- f- uh, photographers at, you know, a team doesn't send their their, 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 their sports information team to an away game. So sometimes they'll just put up a photo that's, you okay, that's not that game. That was a home game. You're in your home uniform, whatever. So FCS can get challenging. But essentially my process is I have my spreadsheets um, for FCS, or sorry, for FBS. And um, what I try to do is, and I, then I have a, 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 I have a single, well, it's three pages, but a spreadsheet that lists every team and what time they're playing. And I color code the games by, you know, for me out here on the West Coast, the 9 a.m. games, the 12.30 games, and essentially the 4 p.m. games, or any that falls kind of in those windows. So I know what I'm looking for. So if I'm at home, I can flip around the dial and get through whatever, 10 games, whatever's on. But with more teams posting so much on Twitter these days, usually I'm just flipping through Twitter and look at, well, search a team, search a school, and I'll just look and, and get a quick check. And say, okay, they got a game photo. They got a game photo. They got a game photo. Um, schools today do a lot of releases. You know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So they're putting out their release videos. But I'll tell you, and you might watch out for this, Darren. This season, this this is something you'll see, and you're like, he was right. Teams will do these uniform release, crazy cool videos in the forest and the whatever. I mean, they do all these things, and they're showing the uniform. I get to see a uniform reveal, but they never, not never. Many times they don't give you enough of a close-up shot of the helmet to understand, is it a new helmet or not? Like, they kind of doing their crazy edits and cuts and coolness and, you know, is that a new stripe or not? Is there a stripe on the helmet? What's the logo? Like, they keep everything mysterious sometimes. So the the reveal, reveal uh, videos aren't necessarily good. 
and I do I do look at those, and I if I and sometimes they do a big PR release around whether it's a military appreciation or something like that. So you're like, okay, I know that they're doing this, but sometimes I like to wait until the game because I've been caught a few times where they've actually said they were going to wear something and then they didn't. So I have to balance that a little bit. But essentially, what I do is I try to do it on Saturday if I'm have the time. Um, or if I can sneak it in while I'm out and about. Um, and then on Sunday morning, I do kind of my final catch-up. But what I basically do is I, I verify, I go through every game, and hopefully through a Twitter shot, I can see both teams. And I know generally, you know, in my spreadsheet, in my page that I have the color-coded games, you know, I make notes on, I know which teams are generally not changing. And Alabama's not changing, Ohio State's not changing, USC's not changing. So I have, I know what I'm looking for. And it's you know Penn State, State's not changing. <laughs> Penn State generally, I mean, they do a number every once in a while. Um, but, um, uh, you know, what's in, in, in important for me is, is you know, I, I got to make sure that I've, I've looked at every game and verified, yep. And, and even doing all that, I will admit, there are, you know, I think there's other sites that I verify against and I'll be like, oh, shoot, I didn't catch that one in week one and it might be six weeks later. So, you know, there's probably four or five last year that I didn't catch until, until way later because it's just, you know, it's, it's a lot to, you know, make sure that you know, is that a new one or not a new one? And I, I, like I said, I like to think I'm pretty good at knowing that, but every once in a while I get caught um, uh, and didn't, didn't realize that they, they did something. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, Miami of Ohio, they had a helmet um, for about four years, like 2016 to 2019, or, and it was a red helmet, but there was a little white shading, um, uh, and they, or a little, sorry, it was a, no, it was a white helmet, sorry, it was a white helmet, and it had a red rim to it, and then the next, in one year, they took the red off, and I didn't notice that, and it wasn't like, massive red it was just a very you know thin around the edge so that was you know those are those are ones but you, you know your, your comment earlier about okay 280 helmets 130 tombs an average of two per team well when you take when you throw out the 45 or 50 teams that probably don't either don't change their helmet or they might wear multiple helmets but it's not new like it's there's a recycling ones so then you say, okay, there's 80 teams. Now you're starting to get up to closer to four. And then you throw out the ones that have only done one new helmet. I mean, the worst conference by far, the conference that I hate the most is the MAC. The MAC oh. has more helmets than any conference. Really? Oh, that oh, surprises me. Huh. Kent, Kent State has been on a roll the last three years. I mean, they have 28, something like 28 new helmets over the last three years. Kent State's you know, a tough one. Um, uh, Miami of Ohio has been a tough one. Toledo slightly. Western Michigan, not as bad as when P.J. Fleck was there. I think if my stat was, if I remember, recall right, in 52 games at Western Michigan, P.J. Fleck had 35 new helmets. Holy cow. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that one's challenging, uh, especially because they're blacks and they're browns, dark browns look awfully similar and, and so on and so forth. Um, but the MAC, the MAC conferences, in fact, I would probably tell you the MAC, the Conference USA, and the Sun Belt are probably the conferences I, I like the least. Um, because you think those are the conferences that should have one helmet and stop messing around. They probably don't have the money, right? Um, but no, they, they probably do the most. I mean, I, I, I debated a few years ago, should I just stop doing those conferences? Um, but I'm so far deep into this, I guess I can't give up any of them. But those are the ones that I that I that are that are absolutely the worst. Well, I, I guess it sounds like when you talked earlier about uh, doing the CFL, you're doing those four games a week over a span of three different days. That's, that's a piece of cake to you. That's yeah, your, yeah, not even I a warm up for you for what's going to happen. Yeah, soon. that one's that one is a very nice one, um, uh, and, and 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 they usually, for the most part, do announce when they're doing new helmets, like the you know Edmonton Elks changed their helmet this year. They went back to the, the double E, albeit not in an oval, um, but they announced that. Um, Hamilton announced they were gonna do their, their hammer helmet. Um, but then Calgary surprised me, uh, wore, the, wore the regular helmet in preseason and then game one came out with a new helmet. Like, hmm. I mean, you know, just 
out of nowhere. So CFL is just for you to keep you on your toes. Keep me on my toes. CFL is relatively easy, obviously. And I've also made all the CFL helmets in my collection. So in terms of my collection, you know, I have all the FC, FBS schools. I have all the NFL. I have Canadian. Um, I do have like the WFL, USFL, XFL. So I have a bunch of those. I had a bunch of other leagues, you, you know, all those indoor leagues, whatever, IFL, at SFL, PSFL, whatever, all these. And I had them made and then I got rid of them because I was running out of space and I needed the cases for them as well. So, um, but yeah, pretty much what I'm doing on my site, I'm, I'm mirroring, you know, in my collection with the exception of FCS. I only have the Ivy League, North Dakota State and um, Idaho just because they were in FBS and dropped down. But I have put it on my list. We have three schools we have to do because they're jumping up to FBS. So, you know, Sam Houston State, Jacksonville State, and James Madison. So we're making those helmets. I have all those on my website. Um, But then I think where I'll probably start making more helmets will be um, uh, the Big Sky. Um, You know, uh, I love the Montanas, the Montana States. You know, I grew up in the north, somewhat northwest. So I'll probably do some Big Sky and then I'll do... um, the Missouri Valley Conference, because that's a powerhouse conference, South Dakota, South Dakota State, North Dakota. I already had North Dakota State, as I mentioned. So those would be some of those that I'll make. Make um, I think I'll probably make on those. All right. Well, I, I got to ask a question be, before uh, we sign off here. Okay. So you, let's say you have a guest over your house. It's, it's not over very often, but they want You have that. What's that showpiece of your collection? The one that you are the most proud of that you want to make sure a guest sees what, what's that helmet and what what well, area is it from what i would tell you is what a guest sees generally what's most important to them and what i like to show them is where do they go to school that's what they want to see so if they okay. were a you know a, a graduate of, a, of an fbs school that's where they gravitate to first it's like oh my god because generally if they're a football fan they go, oh my God, I was in school when that helmet was being worn, you know? And and so then they want to take a picture of it and things like that. So I wouldn't say it's anything about what I want to show them. Um, When they ask me, hey, what's your favorite? And of course, besides the Washington State helmets, which is where I, you know, went to school. um, My favorite helmet is um, a Navy helmet that they did versus Army. You know, they've, both schools have kind of gotten into doing these classic um, throw, not throwbacks, classic uh, one game helmets. And they did a series, um, gosh, was it 50, 2015, I think? They did seven different hand-painted helmets with seven different battleships on them. And it's, they're beautiful. And the, my guy who made them, I wasn't sure if he was going to be able to make those or not. Because um, there's a few we haven't made that he goes, I don't know how I'm going to make these, but I thought those would be in that list. And no, he made them. So people say, what's your favorite? I go, it's the Navy battleship helmets. Those are definitely my favorites for people to see. But again, people, people graduate to... You know, or gravitate, gravitate, gravitate to where they went to school. That's what they want to see, um, or where their dad went to school, or you know, or who they're a fan of, whatever. That's that's definitely it. But the the the, the helmets, um, I displayed it. So we we moved, and the picture on my website was from my old house. It was in my one of my garages, which we never used as a garage. It was my helmet room. But I built shelves on the wall, and I had basically two walls covered with the helmets. So. Uh, we're here in the process of in Vegas of um, putting an addition onto our house. We're adding a whole new two and a half car garage so I can take over the existing two car and turn it into a memorabilia room. So I've taken off the garage door, putting windows on. And so, so you have a helmet wing is what you're trying to I say. Have a, you're exactly <laughs> right. Uh, and one other thing I just want to share with you, um, you know, you mentioned people coming over to my house and seeing, seeing the helmets, um, which I love. And, but of course it's only the few people who come over to my house. I had the opportunity this year at the NFL draft, which was here in Vegas, and uh, the company I work for, Caesar Sportsbook, is a sponsor of the NFL, and we had an activation space at the draft, a 30 by 30 space, and they were just trying to figure out, like, what do we do with this space? And my one of my CEOs, who who is a football fan, and, knew, and we got talking about helmets, and he knew about my helmet collection, et cetera, he's like, why don't we put your helmets out um, uh, at the draft? And so I have them in these cases 40 helmets a case these acrylic cases see-through cases they built these units to put the cases in so we had six units 10 feet long each so 30 feet on each side that had all my college and all my nfl helmets and it was it was wonderful to be able to just get it out and let people people see that so that was pretty cool so um yeah you know listen i'm i I don't know i mean it's, it's kind of scary to think 
I don't know that I'm ever going to give this up and I can't give up the website. You know, it's like I put so much into it. I think what I'd like to be able to do some and, and, and maybe somebody hears me on, on, on this podcast um, and volunteers, but I, I really would love to have some people to help me who want to be involved and say, hey, I'll, I'll track these conferences or I'll do this or I'll add this to the website so that there's multiple people doing it because it is a lot of work. Um, I'm trying to recruit my, my son's 15 and when he was younger, when he was like five, he was really into the helmets. Um, he could name every team, college, all this stuff. He chose his NFL team, um, which sadly he chose the New York Jets because their 1963 helmet had an airplane on it. So when he was like four, and he's like, I, want, I like the Jets helmet, I, you know, this old helmet. So he stuck with them, surprisingly, he stuck with them. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm trying to recruit him in, and I said, maybe you can do FCS this year because there's only. There might be across the schools that I'm doing, you know, 30 to 40 new helmets, but you got to pay attention. You got to look at the detail. You got to know what they've worn previously to understand is that new or not. So I'm not sure I can count on them or not. We'll see. <laughs> but I said maybe you could start with FCS, but I would love more people to help me at some point because it, it, it is a lot of work and I love it and it is a passion, um, but it can be very consuming. And like I said, especially when I'm busy on the weekend when I'm traveling and you're going to a game and I'm looking at Twitter and I'm searching, oh crap, that's a new helmet and I got to tweet it out and so on and so forth. So, um, but it's fun. It's a passion and I love it. And, um, you know, I, I, everybody should have a passion. Everybody should have a, have a hobby. And this is, this is what it is for me. Okay. Listeners, if you would like to, uh, you know, help blaze in this great project, this labor of love of identifying new helmets, uh, you can go to that helmethistory.com. He's got a contact, uh, bar up at the top of his header just click on that and uh believe me he gets back to you pretty quick because that's how i got in touch with him and blaze why don't you give us uh your twitter handle one more time here so sure. we can make sure and, and your website too so people sure, uh, sure. it's a uh, twitter handle is at wtf coach is my twitter handle and then the website is helmethistory.com and like you said there is a contact uh, uh tab on there for people to contact me and I'm also listen if 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 any of your listeners have um, they have better photos um, if they have information that I'm missing or something that I'm missing I, I love when people send me things to make the website better I'm trying to make it better for everybody because I hope that this is going you know this is the the master site that is the most detailed about how much history across all those leagues that I'm tracking but if there's something that I don't have or something that you have that is a better quality please send it on and I'm and I'm happy to uh, to add it to the site Okay, and if you're driving and you can't can't write this information down, go ahead. Feel free to get in contact with us here, pigskindispatch at gmail.com, and we will get you in contact with Blaze uh, to help out on this project. Blaze Da Silva, we really appreciate you taking the time, and we really appreciate the work of preserving that football history uh, through the, the headgear that the players have wore at all levels, uh, or college and, and pro level, and uh, really appreciate great site, helmethistory.com. Thank you, Darren. Thanks for having me on. That's all the football history we have today, folks. Join us back tomorrow for more of your football history. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. offices of the Pittsburgh Guardian newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? 
I ordered it from the Row One website, where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. <laughs> Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so Retro it was that Marla Delft discovered the spondiferous magic of Row One Sports memorabilia arts and prints. You can too by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. That's R O W number one today for access to the full Row One catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, Sports Writer. Coming soon. Okay,